Thank you uh, very much. Um, you are the early birds, the people who partied hard last night, um, but got up this morning um, for the presentation. So you have already achieved a, a great thing. You can now all go home. So um, the BCLA is very proud to be associated uh, with this conference. Um, and as Giorgio has already said, we have formed a partnership to try and make sure that we bring contact lenses to the forefront of optometric education. As we talked about yesterday, the number of people taking up contact lenses is still relatively low, maybe about 8% of the Italian population. Whereas for spectacles, of course, much larger, and particularly, as we mentioned yesterday, when people become presbyopic, Actually, everybody needs a correction. And yet, the number of people being fitted with contact lenses goes down further. And the analogy I like to give is your wardrobe. You don't have just one set of clothes. In the morning, you go to your wardrobe, you open it up, and you choose the most suitable clothes for what you're doing. You wouldn't wear high heels to um, go for a walk in the mountains but likewise you wouldn't wear your walking boots to go to a party. And yet when it comes to vision correction, quite often we think that patients should only have their one correction. Actually, it gives them power and the ability to choose for suitability. There are many advantages of contact lenses over spectacles, for example, but there might be some cases let's say late in the day, when people want to wear their spectacles. And of course that is good for business, but it is also good for the patient. So it's really important that we understand vision care <coughs> in its <coughs> fullness across uh, all the modalities. Now the British Contact Lens Association, BCLA, much as it still has British in its title, really isn't very British anymore. And that is because this is an international platform that we are working with. So we tend to refer to BCLA, meaning the organisation that encompasses contact lens care. And because it is one of the first organisations that was dedicated purely to contact lenses and the anterior eye, it is quite different from many of the conferences uh, that we have around the world. So the main conference that the BCLA runs, which is in the UK now every two years, over half of the people who come are not from the UK. So it is a much broader organisation uh, than that. So I'm going to share with you a, a few slides to try and explain what the BCLA is about. Um, and then we will progress to Dr Nauru, who will talk more about IACL, which is focused more on the side of educators. The BCLA is, as I say, an international organisation, but it is also a truly interdisciplinary organisation. And really, it contains four main groups. So it contains optometrists, as you would expect, also opticians and ophthalmologists, particularly across Europe. Ophthalmology still has uh, a large number of uh, people within their profession who are fitting uh, contact lenses. So it is very important that we engage with the ophthalmologists, although in many countries now, optometry is growing in terms of the number of people in that profession. But the other major group is industry, because actually it's that interaction with industry that makes contact lenses uh, and the anterior eye very different from other areas um, that perhaps we're involved in. This is a two-way interaction to make sure that we feed into industry so they produce the products that our patients need, but we are all involved in healthcare delivery, making sure the patients have the best options for their lifestyle, but also uh, safe options. In terms of the BCLA, you can become a member uh, of the BCLA and there are various different aspects to that. And the uh, first aspect to that is actually the social side, the networking side. 
Here are a group of people who take contact lenses uh, very seriously and want to improve what we can offer our patients. So it means that uh, you can interact with all of the people in uh, this field. So even as a relatively uh, young optometrist, we were interacting with people like Nathan Efron. So it's great to have that kind of uh, interaction. It also, of course, has an education role. It has various different ways of doing that education. It has a regular newsletter, uh, for example, to bring you up to date with the sorts of things that it is doing. But perhaps more importantly, on the website you have access to presentations, to guidelines, to uh, libraries. Uh, we'll talk later on in the workshop about access to research. Again, these are really important things if you want to stay cutting edge. And again, as I said yesterday, the difference between school education and university education, why you all have diplomas and degrees, is because you are at the cutting edge. That is what your patients are buying into when they come to you. That is why we are a profession rather than just someone who is selling a commodity uh, in a store. That is the difference. So we need to be at that cutting edge. And the only way we can do that um, is to listen to presentations, to come to events like this, um, to make sure that we get that kind uh, of information. So even if you can't make some of the BCLA conferences, as a member, you can access the videos of those presentations to make sure that you can listen to the topics that you're interested in, myopia control, computer vision syndrome, all of these new topics and the latest research uh, in those areas. The BCLA also prints its own journal. There are only really now two journals dedicated uh, to contact lens. This is, um, and this is the primary journal, Contact Lens and Anterior Eye. And in fact, the editor uh, for that journal is over to the far right there, Dr. Nauru, one of his many, uh, many hats. And of course, we're quite used to the printed version that we get, and that's very useful. But nowadays, there are also apps for your phone, so you can flick back. Oh, I seem to remember there was a presentation by Bruce Evans on... Um, how we determine um, eye dominance. You can have a quick search and bring up that article uh, to have a look at. So this is really, again, a powerful way of keeping you up to date uh, with the latest research. And hopefully some of you uh, actually will get to publish in those journals uh, as well. In terms of the conferences, um, traditionally, the BCLA has always had one big conference each year uh, in May, normally at the end of May, that's drawn lots of people to the UK. They decided last year to change the picture a little bit. So now the big conference in the UK is only every other year. So it happened last year and it will happen next year. And many people thought, well, actually, that's good. We can have a quieter year. Unfortunately, that didn't quite happen. So we have been involved in the Dutch conference, the NCC, uh, which happened uh, last month. Obviously, we have been involved in this conference in Italy. And actually, we have a big conference in Hong Kong in September. I think it's the 13th and 14th uh, of September this year, if anyone likes um, different climates. Wonderful place. Uh, I go there quite regularly. Um, but we have a two-day conference uh, across in Hong Kong. So actually, again, the BCLA is changing and diversifying um, and using its brand, which is all about cutting-edge research informing teaching, to a wider uh, field as well. What happens at those conferences? Well, they're very big uh, affairs, typically uh, a thousands or so people. Um, with uh, lectures around the latest education, uh, as you would expect from uh, any conference. I did have a look through my files and I found uh, a picture of a lecturer. 
This is a bit shocking. Uh, 2004, this picture was taken. I thought I hadn't aged that much, but clearly this guy is a little bit younger. <coughs> so, uh, lectures um, about different areas of education. It's been really great over the last few days to see the posters here. I think that is a fantastic addition to your conference. I've seen lots of people reading and engaging with those posters and it's been great to see uh, the students on the joint IBZ uh, Aston course uh, providing some of those posters, but also other institutions as well. We learn so much uh, from posters about cutting edge uh, research, clinically relevant pearls, different ways that people may have approached uh, patients. But also, I think it's really important is actually to meet the author. One of the problems with the presentation is I stand up here and you sit down there. Actually, with a poster, you can talk to the person who wrote it. You can ask why they did a particular uh, method. You can talk about your experiences, which will inform future research because they can then say, oh, that's interesting, that's not been tested. Uh, how do we move uh, forward with that? So posters can give us a lot of information. Um, they can give us new techniques. They can tell us a way, the way that uh, industry is moving. All really important type aspects. We also have case studies. Case studies, so this is describing how we managed uh, a particular uh, case. And while in terms of evidence it's only a single case, it might be a, an exception to the rule, actually it is where everything begins. Because many of the major conditions have been reported first uh, as cases. So they identify where clinical research is needed. All of these big topics, thalidomide, toxic shock syndrome and AIDS were first described as case records. So people noticed something, they reported it as a case record, something of interest, and that alerted the community to actually this is something we need to study. And of course we remember with thalidomide all of the deformed babies that were born um, from this um, magic pill that was supposed to reduce um, sickness during pregnancy, toxic shock syndrome which still kills uh, many people today when we release um, the blood uh, supply after it's been stopped and of course AIDS which has been absolutely huge and devastating in terms of its impact. So again it shows the importance of that interaction between research and clinical practice um, and in the workshop this afternoon I will talk more about that um, to show that actually it is a continuum, it is not these are researchers and these are clinicians. So there are many different uh, case records, again, that can be reported with nice pictures, for example, again, to help you and inform you in terms of your clinical practice. We also tend to have uh, photographic competitions as well to encourage people to use uh, the latest technology. Again, these look very attractive, but they tell us about how people <coughs> are using technology. And of course, we've moved now from cameras. There are some fantastic cameras in the exhibition where we can take a picture of uh, an eye, for example, with a uh, slit lamp. Here is one um, some from someone you may well know. Um, to the ability to take a picture with our um, smartphone, for example. So again, a very powerful way that we can capture images, that we can communicate with patients, um, but also um, be informed. The social side of the BCLA is also very important. This was another picture I dug out from my uh, archives with my uh, wife. But people have lots of fun at the BCLA. Um, we have a big gala dinner um, on the uh, night before the end of the conference. And they also tend to have uh, themes. So a couple of years ago, uh, we had a Bollywood uh, theme. So everybody got dressed up um, in costume. So we have a lot of fun as well as the uh, education. Both those aspects are really important because that brings people together. That is all part 
of uh, the networking. Now, last night, of course, we uh, honoured uh, Francesco Sala for his BCLA fellowship, which he achieved. Uh, he adds to that number, so I guess it's uh, 225 fellows uh, now rather than 224. The fellowship of the BCLA is not a formal exam. We couldn't have a formal exam because, of course, people from industry have a very different uh, experience than a clinician um, from ophthalmology, where they might be dealing more with um, anterior eye disease compared to an optician, which might be more uh, fitting lenses. So what it is all about is kudos. So what we're looking at here is esteem what people have achieved and contributed to this uh, field. So why gain that esteem? Well, there are lots of different uh, reasons, because actually we are here, we train to do a job, but actually the interest in the job comes from making sure we are at the top of what we can do. And we had some interesting discussions yesterday about the profession. I know that there are more to come uh, at lunchtime today. But it's really interesting and fascinating to see the expanse of what we can do and what we can offer our patients. And actually, that's what makes it interesting. Quite often in optometry, I know when I joined optometry, I thought about doing medicine afterwards. But actually, medicine is no more interesting than optometry if you practice at the top of your game. Because what does a general practitioner do? He gives a medication for a cough, another medication for a cough. It is very boring unless you make it interesting for yourself. And contact lenses is one of the prime areas of optometric practice where we can make it very interesting because it moves forward all the time. What we learned two years ago, very different today. That's not something that we could say about other areas like binocular vision, for example, moves far more slowly. So how do we gain esteem in contact lenses and anterior eye? Well, there are lots of areas. We could provide enhanced clinical practice. We've talked about keratoconic management, for example, tackling more complex cases. We could get involved in writing magazine articles. We could undertake uh, research, and research in clinical practice is very powerful, even if you're not in a university. We could develop a new initiative. We could decide that we're going to um, ring up our patients after two weeks to try and reduce the dropout rate and examine whether that has an impact. And we can involve ourselves in teaching, whether that's through a conference or through a university <coughs> or a college. And of course, we have areas that can help us gain esteem, coming to courses or conferences like this. Qualifications, such as the BCLA Fellowship, um, and also things like IACL, if you're an educator. So how do you gain the BCLA Fellowship? Well, the BCLA Fellowship is for members. We've already said it is very easy to become a member. And a little bit like the American Academy of Optometry, it is done on a point system. So you need to get 50 points, and I'll show you how you can get those points. And once you have those points, that goes to a committee to check that they are happy that you've reached that level. So Francesco did that before the conference. And then you are invited to a viva, and you meet with two existing fellows who talk to you about your experiences um, and why you want to be a BCLA fellow. And that gives an opportunity then for us to agree that you have meet, met that level of esteem. In terms of the point system, as you would imagine from a multidisciplinary area, there are lots of different things that you can get points for. You can do case records. Um, so this is where, again, you are reflecting on a case that you've seen, normally a more complex case, and looking at the literature as how other people have managed this kind of patient to build up a useful picture for other people. You can present a paper or a poster at a BCLA clinical conference. So the people who have presented posters at this conference um, or have stood up and done a presentation would gain 10 points 
for those. You can be involved in a book chapter or an editorial ship of a book, for example. Um, presentations at a workshop. Again, there are some workshops this afternoon. Postgraduate degrees. I know some of you have been involved in things like PhDs or MSCs or professional doctorates. Uh, again, all of those count. Uh, industry enhancements. So for people who work in industry, getting involved in patents or new designs, that can all count for points. And also there is a category for a highly significant contribution to contact lenses. So this captures non-BCLA um, presentations, for example, being involved in teaching and other things which again count towards people's esteem. As I've said, it gets examined by a panel of experts and then awarded the status FBCLA. You get a, a badge to uh, wear. And as long as you are a paid up member of the BCLA and continue your education at least uh, every three years uh, at one of the BCLA type events, then you can use the affix FBCLA as well. So again, it identifies those people who have gone that bit further in contact lenses. And I'm very glad to say that we have several Italians in our membership of FBCLAs, as well as people from across uh, the globe. If you're interested more, you can go to the website, which again has those uh, criteria and also uh, the way to submit. Um, I still look after the fellowships of the BCLA, so again, I am happy to look at things that you send me to say, maybe you need to change it slightly this way, or that should be sufficient to get your points. And in terms of deadlines, it just depends when the next opportunity for the Vivas comes up. So, for example, we had a Viva yesterday. The next opportunity will be in September in Hong Kong, and then probably the following May in, um, in the UK. And those fellows, not only do you get the fellowship status, but those fellows also um, come together at the conferences. So again, it's an opportunity to meet other fellows, other people who have taken those further steps in contact lenses to engage and network uh, with that group. So it is a, a nice opportunity for you to make a real statement in the area of contact lenses. So hopefully that's given you a reasonable overview of the BCLA. As I say, it's not just a British organisation, an international multidisciplinary organisation, which hopefully allows you to reach high heights in terms of what you can deliver in contact lens and anterior eye care for your patients of the future. Many thanks for your attention.